Okay, um, my name's Annie Flint. I've worked in women's health uh, for about 30 years. Um, I started off being um, a registered nurse uh, and found very quickly that I was very interested in sexual and reproductive health. Uh, so I veered off into um, family planning. Um, it was a, one of the older organisations that um, were very much feminist based and um, worked exclusively with women and therefore um, I suppose offered a workplace that was um, very consistent with my political and um, personal values and beliefs. Um, I didn't think, when I was growing up, I didn't think of myself as a feminist. I grew up in country New South Wales and um, yeah, it was it was sort of almost a non-issue. You know, we, we went to the footy on Sundays and, you know, those sorts of um, things were very much um, part of part of growing up and part of our world. But I quickly realised that there were differences um, between men and women and how men and women were treated. And um, certainly as I grew older and went nursing when I was 18, I, um, I, I guess I just started to become more and more interested in that. And um, that led me to, um, uh, yeah, the work that I've been involved in and certainly um, more recently to Jesse Street and, um, you know, the poster project. Um, in terms of the summit, I guess um, we're holding it as part of, there's a network called the Australian Women's Health Network. We're a national body and uh, voluntary, all run by volunteers. Um, and we were having a, a national women's health conference every five years, uh, but the conferences were so successful that our membership and um, agencies in the community sort of said to us, we want them more, we want them more. But putting on a national conference um, costs a lot of money <laughs> and um, it's a huge amount of work and all of us have got, you know, other paid work that we do. So we didn't have a lot of time. So we decided that each state would, um, around every three years, hold a summit um, that uh, focused on, you know, key issues um, around women's health um, especially. Um, and uh, the summit that's on this Thursday is, is about that. It's, it's sort of looking at the fact that it's almost 30 years since the National Women's Health Policy was released. Um, that was released at a time, well, it was the late 80s, um, but it was on the back of a huge national survey that had been undertaken around women's health. Um, and the feedback that the government of the day got was that women were unhappy with um, the services that were out there, um, access to those services, and the fact that they didn't really um, represent or, or respond to, you know, what they believed their needs were. Interestingly, 30 years down the track, those same issues are more and more relevant today than they ever have been. And I think, um, you know, when the National Women's Health Policy came into being, it was, um, it was quite trailblazing at the time. Um, it was informed by women across Australia, but it was certainly um, reflective of the feminist movement that had been, you know, kind of had a groundswell in the sort of late 60s, 70s. Um, and a lot of things were changing or had changed. Um, you know, women were working um, often equally as much as um, their husbands or partners. Um, and it was mostly husbands back then. It was pretty avant-garde even in the 80s to not be married. Um, and um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of the issues that, that were certainly topical then are still topical now. And yet there has been, you know, significant international and national uh, things that have happened that have, you know, had a major impact on that. I think the social determinants of health, we talk about that all the time, um, 
and I guess for women the most significant, powerful social determinant of, he determinant of health is gender. Uh, just the fact that we are women or that men are men. Um, it defines so much of our lives and it's more than just the fact that, you know, we have different, um, there are sex differences. There are a whole range of social um, constructs that go with the idea of gender. And um, in spite of the work that the women's health movement started and that the women's health sector has continued, um, we still haven't made much of an impact around gender. Uh, a good example, although it's a little bit more topical these days, but a really good example is um, around heart disease um, and other chronic diseases like diabetes and um, uh, some of the other chronic diseases. Um, stroke, yeah, there are, there are many. Um, and, uh, you know, heart disease, Part of that was defined by a study, a huge study that started in the States in about the late 40s or late 50s called the Framingham Study. Um, so they started this study, it included equal numbers of men and women, um, but they found fairly early into it, about three years into it, that heart disease, uh, which was part of what they were focusing on back then, um, was very much a man's illness. Um, it, it affected men significantly in their mid-40s. There didn't seem to be any kind of um, impact on women. Um, and so women are still equal participants in that survey. It's a, a, an ongoing survey, longitudinal survey, that's still going today. Um, so they, the focus kind of shifted, I guess, a bit. And what they started to do was realise that, you know, men were being um, impacted significantly by heart disease and they needed to find out a lot, or as much as they could, as quickly as they could, because men were dying, um, and women weren't, um, and that, you know, they were often dying sort of mid-age. You know, they had wives, families, um, and, you know, there were big impacts on the workforce apart, you know, as well as the interpersonal sort of things that were happening. Um, so that then led to governments putting a lot of money into heart research where men were the participants. Um, and so a lot of information in that, you know, sort of 25 years or 30 years uh, was generated around men. And not that that's a bad thing. <laughs> it was a good. It was. It was a good thing, but it created a huge bias. Um, that still stands today where women are frequently not participants in research um, across many domains but particularly around heart research um, and that a lot of the, the you know the strategies and the information that they found were you know applied to men but it didn't apply to women a good example of that is um, taking aspirin um, you know aspirin can be prophylactically you take it every day, it can be preventative around strokes um, particularly, but that isn't the case for women. But, you know, suddenly we had a lot of women who, um, you know, were being prescribed drugs in the same way men were, yet, you know, our menstrual cycles and hormones and all of those things affect that. Um, and, you know, the same findings that they got from researching, you know, men didn't, couldn't be applied, yet they were being applied. The focus of the summit is really around gender um, and the social determinants of health. And so the other social determinants of health are education, race, um, housing, employment, um, all of those things that, you know, define our daily lives. And so, you know, in Australia today, if you're a black, if you're an Aboriginal woman, then your life expectancy is at least 15 years less than if you're a non-Aboriginal woman, um, you're much more likely to be, uh, to experience um, homelessness, poverty, disadvantage, not continuing your education. Um, so, you know, all of those things are critical. They define our lives. And for those of us who are, 
you know, privileged enough to have a job and, you know, a well-paid job. Um, you know, it gives you choice in your life and, and, you know, choice in your life makes you a happier person and, you know, then enables you to do a whole lot of other things. So the focus is definitely around um, trying to sort of um, highlight the social determinants of health and certainly how they, how they impact on women's lives. Yeah, we definitely have. Um, and they're reflective of the content of the um, summit. A few years ago, so 2013, we had the National Women's Health Conference, which was here in Sydney. Um, and we decided that we wanted to have, as part of the conference, a fairly robust arts program. And um, when we kind of drilled down to what that might look like, um, we engaged with, oh, of course now I've just forgotten the um, Milk Crate Theatre, which is a, they're not specifically women only, um, but they're a local community based theatre group here in Sydney, uh, where they work with um, people who experience disadvantage, particularly social disadvantage. Many um, people who've become involved with Milk Crate um, have mental quite significant mental health issues and again a range of all of those sort of um, social health issues that, that are created as a result of that. Um, homelessness being one of them and so we, we engaged Milk Crate to um, be part of the arts program. Um, we looked into art itself and having you know possibly an artist on the day who might be drawing or photographing or, you know, looking at, um, you know, reflecting sort of, you know, some aspects of women's lives through the conference, um, which then drew us to, I've always really loved posters and I guess my early work in the women's health field, um, a lot of these posters were posters that were developed by um, printing companies that you know, aren't around now, um, that we used to work with all the time. Um, and so um, we looked to Jesse Street. We knew that they had a, a fantastic poster um, collection. We didn't know how, how fantastic it was until we came and realised there were, um, they were part way through the process of catalog cataloguing them and digitising them. Um, they had just they were probably a third of the way into that process, so it's amazing to come here, you know, in such like two years later, really, um, and see that you know they've completed that process and they're now um, going to be um, the owners of you know a range of other collections of posters as well. Um, so the posters are, are really significant. They they represent. A time, it's a bit like a photograph, you know, it's a, a moment in time. Um, but all of the posters um, related to, you know, issues that were very specific of that, you know, year or that decade or that sort of thing. So um, we have, we've chosen the, the, the ones that we've got to reflect some of the themes from the summit, um, but also because they're still really topical today. Um, well, we, when um, we were looking for artworks um, and uh, we came across one of, the, one of the people on the management committee for the conference had gone to something at um, Parliament House a couple of years before. I just forget what that event was, but it was a pictorial history um, and one of the women here Jan Burnswood uh, was um, charged with the job of putting the, the um, posters together for that um, event and uh, so we backtracked, found her and uh, yeah, we're very happy that um, she was still here at Jessie Street. Uh, so yeah, we came and met with Jan and the other volunteers at the library and I guess our relationship began then. So that probably would have been in about 2011. Um, and the, you know, the women 
that are working here are not only do they have amazing sort of life experience and um, you know that history, uh, their willingness to share it was a pleasure. Absolutely, and I would bet that every woman here that is part of this library, she may not identify as a feminist now, but would would have been and yeah. would still be. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, the, the voice of women, um, it's hard to, 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 for that voice to be heard now. Um, you know, we've become sort of very mainstream and, you know, there are some great advantages to that. It's, it can be more inclusive, um, but it's also harder for a particular message to be heard. And I think part of the jo one of the joys of, of the poster collection, but also the library, is that, you know, w that woman's voice and, yeah. and that woman's story. And it's, it's not lost, it's very much alive. That's my favourite one, and it, it, it's a beautiful design. Um, but it's also the nature of, uh, you know, the fact that this is Aboriginal land; it always will be, and that it's very easy, particularly in a mainstream, you know, Western kind of culture, to forget that. Um, we've still got quite a long way to go. Um, Aboriginal women are strong, you know, a testament to their strength is that they're still there despite everything that they've endured, um, including the stolen generation, um, which in many ways um, lives on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really important for them to be recognised and, and respected and acknowledged. Probably my second favourite would be this one, Make Policy Not Tea. Yep. Um, and we, we had a strong um, uh, voice for electoral lobby and other government sort of um, units that were promoting women. Um, but, you know, over the years um, that's been lost and, you know, to more recently where, in fact, the Minister for Women was a man. <laughs> Um, which, you know, for some of us die-hard feminists, you know, we almost, well, we never got over it. But this poster here is particularly significant uh, because the woman in the middle of the poster, her name is Danielle Crozier, and she's the um, uh, CEO of Women's Health New South Wales, which is the peak uh, body for women's health in New South Wales. Um, Danielle's a very young woman there, and she was working at... Uh, Bankstown Women's Health Centre at the time. Um, Bankstown Women's Health Centre is still there. Uh, their focus has shifted a little bit over the years um, because back then it was very much women's health centres um, were, you know, very much for women by women um, and they definitely were where, um, you know, feminists worked and um, I guess created communities. Um, they, you know, safety was on the agenda. A whole range of issues that had never really been picked up were on the agenda. So I chose this one for the summit because um, of Danielle's current position, but also her, um, the fact that, you know, she's still um, out there blazing the feminist trail and not only in New South Wales, but in Australia. There are so many great things about it, but I think the most significant thing is that it's it's a women's library and, um, you know, significant women, important women are very visible, um, both, you know, physically, you can look around and, yeah. and, and see some of their images, yeah. but there's a, there's a, a vibe, there's yeah. a presence here, yeah, an energy here. Um, and so it's, it's a bastion of, of feminism <laughs> um, for me. And, and I think the, you know, the stories of women that, that will live on as a result of it.